Welcome to this lecture series in group theory. In this lecture, we'll be discussing the notion of cyclic groups and let us recall a few things that we need for this lecture. So one thing we proved earlier is that if we have a finite abelian group and it has order elements of order m and n, then it also has an element of order LCM, m and n. So that is one thing that we'll use. And the other thing we will use is about polynomials that we developed in the course of a few lectures is that if you have a polynomial of degree d, d is greater than or equal to 1, let's say. Uh, so let me write that here. Although it also applies to non-zero polynomials of degree 0, but let me just put it here uh, for simplicity. So if we have a polynomial of degree at least 1 or a field f, let's say, then that polynomial has at most d distinct roots. Okay, so we'll use this fact and we'll also, you know, we, we want to make use of the field structure that we discussed on Z mod PZ. So this was a finite field that we discussed. Uh, as a set, it is same as Z mod PZ. This has a natural addition and multiplication and it is a field. Okay, so let's get started. The, today we will not have any problems. So let's define what is a cyclic group. A group G is called cyclic if there is g in the group, little g in the group, such that the subgroup generated by it equals the whole group. So this is the subgroup generated by g. And if you recall, this is nothing but, one can easily show it is nothing but what I just wrote. So if it, if it has a single generator, we say it is a cyclic group. Okay, so that's a very simple and nice definition, but here is a nice reformulation of it, which is quite powerful, I would say, and this way of thinking about things is what I want to instill in the viewer. So we have a group G, then we claim that it is cyclic if and only if there is a surjective homomorphism from this group to that group. So first of all, let me just comment that Z is a cyclic group. Z is a cyclic group simply because the integer one is a generator of it and minus one is another generator and these are the only two generators. There are no other generators of the group. So this is a cyclic group and this proposition says that in some sense, this is universally cyclic. Every other cyclic group appears as a surjective image of it. And if we invoke the first isomorphism theorem, we can say that every other cyclic group appears as a quotient of it up to isomorphism. Because once you have a surjective homomorphism from Z to some group, then you can just factor out by the kernel and get an isomorphism. So every cyclic group is a quotient of the, of, of the group of integers. All right, so let's see why. Why is that? It's a very simple argument. Uh, let's say G is cyclic. So assume G is cyclic. and let G be such that it generates the group and then define just define a map phi from Z to G which takes N to G to the power N and easy to check that and we have done this previously or maybe I gave it as an exercise that this is a group homomorphism and it is of course surjective simply because this guy generates the group. So if you have a cyclic group, then you have a subjective group homomorphism onto it with the domain Z. And for the other way around, now suppose phi is a subjective homomorphism, uh, then let's say G be the image of one. And we claim that, I mean, there's nothing to claim, then basically this equals G. And that's clear because what is the image of N? That's simply because phi N is nothing but G to the N. That's the reason. Since this is surjective, every element here is image of some integer under phi and image of the nth integer is that. So everything here appears as a power of little g 
and therefore little g generates that guy. So converse also holds and we have shown that a group is cyclic if and only if there is a surjective group homomorphism from the group of integers onto that group. And this will be very useful. Okay, uh, a corollary of it is that a group is cyclic if and only if it is isomorphic to z mod nz for some natural number, or sorry, not natural number, of, for some whole number n. Uh, so the thing is the following. We suppose we have a cyclic group, then we get a surjective homomorphism. Surjectivity is usually denoted by a double arrow. We have a surjective homomorphism. Its kernel is going to be nz for some n. Is the kernel of the map phi because kernel phi is going to be a subgroup. Subgroups of z are precisely these objects for some non-negative integer. Or in fact, you can just say for some integer n. That's also equivalent. So if n is zero, then the group is isomorphic to z itself. If n is positive, then the group is isomorphic to a finite group, z mod nz. Uh, if n is zero, then z mod nz is nothing but z, basically. All right, so this is a very simple comment. And we have sort of classified the, the set of all the cyclic groups up to isomorphism. Generally, it's a very hard problem. You know, isomorphism, any, any, any domain of mathematics, you can ask this question. What are all the objects up to isomorphism? So for finite dimensional vector spaces, there's a very simple answer to it. Just you take whatever, you know, fix your field. Uh, what are all the vector spaces of dimension n over f up to isomorphism? They are precisely these, you know, every such vector space is isomorphic to f to the n. So there, there's a very simple classification theorem. But in groups, there is no general classification theorem, not that I'm aware of, and I'd be surprised if there is. There is a theorem about classification of finite simple groups, but that doesn't classify all groups. Anyway, so cyclic groups can be classified, but that doesn't mean that they're not interesting despite our classification. So some, some groups have a, have a description which does not even uh, immediately betray their cyclicity. And we will see one of those in this lecture. So this is another example of a cyclic group. Suppose we have a prime and a group of prime size, meaning a group G with size P, then it is cyclic. So every group with prime size is cyclic and uh, it will in fact be isomorphic to Z mod PZ, as we just saw. So why is that? This was given as an exercise earlier. It's a very simple consequence of Lagrange's theorem. Basically let G in capital G be different from identity. Then the subgroup generated by G is strictly bigger than the trivial subgroup. And also by Lagrange's theorem, the size of this guy divides the size of G, which implies we have a, we have a number greater than one dividing a prime number. So what we get is that this is equal to the size of G. That's the only way it can happen because of primality. And that can happen only when this is actually the whole of G. So any non-identity element is a generator of the group, immediate consequence of Lagrange's theorem. Okay. But now this is very interesting. The previous examples were somewhat simple and easy, but this is very interesting. That this guy is a cyclic group, Z mod P Z star. Okay. So P, well, of course we have to assume something. P is a prime and we want to show that Z mod P Z star is a cyclic group. And uh, the proof of it involves polynomials, and I find it a bit disconcerting as to why such a simple statement, a very down-to-earth statement, is requiring uh, the use of polynomials at all. Uh, we will exploit that this guy is a field, Z mod P, Z with its addition and multiplication is a field. We'll exploit that fact. And I would like to see some more basic proof of it, though I could not find it. Okay, so let's see the proof that I know of. So G be this group. which I may also write as fp star. Okay, and we want to show that G is cyclic. So here is a maximality approach. Let little g in capital G have maximum possible order. So we pick an element which has maximum possible order. There could be multiple such elements, but we just pick one of them. And the goal is to show that uh, goal is to show that order of little g is same as the size of capital G, which is p minus one. So this is our goal, because if we achieve it, then yes, indeed, this would become a generator of the group and hence the group would be cyclic. So that's our goal. So say 
order of little g is integer k. Okay. Now, now here is the thing. We have, okay, so fine. Let h be an arbitrary element. So we have an abelian group and we have two elements, g and h in it. g has some order, whoops. g has some order, h has some order. And as we recalled in the beginning, there must also exist an element whose order is the, is the LCM of this and the order of h. So uh, by what we recalled, uh, there is an element. There is an element of order LCM, order G, order H. But since little g had the maximum possible order amongst all elements of capital G, this thing must be at most order of G. So this is at most order of G. But this, this, you know, this inequality immediately implies that order of H is in fact a factor of order of G. So LCM is obviously at least, at least that, but if you say that LCM of, uh, you know, it, it, what, what I'm really using is that if suppose LCM of A comma B is B, or maybe I should write A, then B divides A. That's the only way it can happen. So that's a very simple number theoretic fact. So what we, what we see is that if you pick any arbitrary element in the group, its order must divide the order of G. We conclude that. And hence, H to the power K is identity. Why is that? K is the order of G. Order of H divides K. This just means that order of H divides K. And if order of H divides K, then of course H to the K is identity. This is true for all h in the group. Okay, now consider, now consider, maybe I should write values fx. fx in fx a polynomial over fp defined as, b defined as, f of x is x to the k minus one. So of course here E is just just the just the you know equivalence class of one which we simply write as one sometimes. You know the element of Z mod the, the how should I say it? The multiplicative identity of this group is one bar which is one plus P N N in integers. That is just sometimes written as one because we understand where we are working. So when I write a one here I should really write one bar but I won't do it. So f of x is this polynomial. And this polynomial has how many roots? Each member of fp star is a root of fx. Why is that? That is immediate from this equation. This equation just reads, another way to write this equation is h to the k is one bar, which I will write simply as one for all h in fp star, because g is nothing but fp star. And hence, this guy vanishes for each element of fp star. Therefore, the degree of the polynomial is at least the size of fp star, because a polynomial cannot have more than uh, its degree many distinct roots. So its degree must be at least the number of distinct roots of it. So we have that, this is equal to p minus one. Well, what is the degree? Degree is k. So basically we conclude that k is at least p minus one. And hence the order of g is at least p minus one. But of course it cannot be more than p minus one. Order of any element of the group cannot be more than the size of the group. So the upshot is that uh, therefore, order of g is indeed equal to the size of the group, which is p minus one, and we are done. This is what we wanted to show. So this part is what I do not like, use of polynomials. So far, so far is fine, this much is fine. 
but I do not want to invoke polynomials to finish this and I could not find a way out. This is the only way that I found on the internet and this is the only way I've seen it in my life. If you know of a different proof, please let me know. But this is a very, very important fact that this guy is a cyclic group. Later we will generalize this. There's a even, you know, stronger theorem that is true. We'll, we'll get to that. But for now, we'll make do with this. Okay. So lastly, now let us see some non-examples. So since cyclic groups are abelian, any non-abelian group is not cyclic. So this is non-abelian for n greater than or equal to 3, simple like the size. I think this is also non-abelian for n greater than or equal to 3, and this is generally non-abelian, the GLN. This guy is mostly non-abelian. Sometimes it can be abelian in some special cases, but mostly non-abelian. So let's see why this is not abelian, z cross z, z2 as we write it. Sorry, what am I saying? Let's see why this is not cyclic. This is of course an abelian group. Why, uh, let's see why this is not a cyclic group. So suppose this is cyclic. Assume on the contrary that this is cyclic. We want to produce a contradiction. Uh, since this is cyclic, uh, let V be some element of Z2 such that the subgroup generated by it is Z2. And uh, we can explicitly write what, what this is. This is nothing but n times V, n is an integer. In the additive notation, this is the subgroup, you know, this is the subgroup generated by that. V times n in the multiplicative notation precisely means that, that thing. So I hope you understand. Um, so now let's say V equals A comma B for some integers A and V. So then we can immediately conclude that A is non-zero and B is non-zero. Why? Because if A were zero, suppose A were zero, then clearly this guy is nothing but the y-axis, you know, the integers on the y-axis. And which is clearly not the entire z2. And similarly, if a, uh, sorry, b were 0, then this guy would be the x-axis or the integers on the x-axis. And that is also clearly different from that. So the, uh, we immediately conclude this. And now we want to show that there is some point here which does not lie here. That's basically what we want to do. So we have a geometric intuition as to which point to contend for. Uh, we have a non-zero and b non-zero. So let's say v is somewhere here. This is our v. And this is the line passing through the origin in V. Basically, intuitively, this is the subgroup generated by V, of course. I'm only talking about the integer points. So we will choose something that is orthogonal to V and show that that cannot possibly lie here. And there's a very easy choice for orthogonality. Minus B comma A. This guy is orthogonal. This guy is orthogonal to that, that because if you take the dot product, it becomes zero. So by our assumption that this is, this is the case, there must be some n such that nv equals that, which would imply na comma nb equals minus b comma a, which implies n equals minus b comma minus b divided by a and n is also equal to a divided by b. But this implies n is both positive and negative. Because if this is a positive thing, this becomes a negative thing and so on. So this implies that n is both positive and negative. And it is legitimate to consider these fractions because a and b are both non-zero. So this is a contradiction and hence uh, we cannot have this generated by a single element and hence this is not a cyclic group. So this was just one example of a non-cyclic group. Okay, so I think this is all for this lecture. As usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. I also have Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.